Good morning, church. If you'd like, you can remove the mask, or if you don't like, you can keep your mask on. I want to begin this morning by uh, giving a praise to our Lord for what he has done through you, his people, in giving. You know, as a church, we don't pass the offering plate. We don't make a big thing about, uh, hey, you cannot leave unless you put something in that box on the wall on your way out. We don't do any of that. Although, uh, never mind. I won't make a joke about that. But I have wonderful news. Our giving for last year during our COVID-19 2020 horrendous year, uh, we had a $30,800 surplus in our giving. Now, every month that we go over our budget and need, we set aside money for distribution. 10% will go to a, a global compassion project, someplace out of the United States where there's a need. So we want to update you on what we did with that money. $1,000 $1,000 was given to Ed and Val Schubert in Honduras. They had a hurricane at the end of the year last year called Hurricane Eta. And you can see from the uh, pictures that it was a pretty devastating hurricane. In fact, uh, a lot of people were scrambling even for their life. So they bought a lot of blankets uh, to distribute to those that had need for covering. And they also bought bags and bags of food to give away. Now, I, had, I, I remember them sending a slide of all these bags, and I could only find one slide with one bag. Believe me, they had more than one bag that they gave away with $1,000 of extra money that we gave them, over and above what we normally give them as a missionary couple. $1,000 was also given to First Love International to help families in Colombia. Because of COVID-19, there were some First Love uh, members, workers there named Leo and Lilia Morales, who told Tom Clinton, we have great need here. People have lost their jobs. They can't feed their families. And so we sent $1,000 of the 3080 And then First Love missionary Jorge uh, Vizuraga, I can't say that correctly. He's our missionary of the month, by the way. And uh, we did a work there in Shringamazoo, Peru, a number of years ago. We sent a mission team there in this remote village. And there were three widows that needed well pumps in order to get fresh water up out of the ground. And so we wanted to buy uh, well pumps for them, and so we sent $1,080. The ELT, that's the elder leadership team, still gets together and go, okay, that was part of it, 30000 what are we going to do with the other money? So let me inform you what we did. We thought that was too much money to hold on to. So we did hold on to 15000 We said, we have old HVAC units. Anybody know what an HVAC unit is? Well, it provides air conditioning in the summer and heat in the winter, and some of them are getting really old and will need to be replaced eventually, and so we put $15,000 aside for that. $6,400 was used for camera upgrades in this room, not only for our online presence, but because we wanted to take the old cameras, put them in the gym, because when we have baptism services or extra services, we wanted to have good quality in the gym as well. And so those cameras, still very good, are in the gym for our services there. We still thought $9,000 we have to give away. So 6000 went to the Freeport Pregnancy Center. They bought... <laughs> Emily says, yeah, why didn't you give us the whole 9000 I'll tell you why. <laughs> 6000 went to the Freeport Pregnancy Center to help with costs of that uh, ultra, what do you call it, um, ultrasound machine. Okay, it was fantastic. She gave us an update on Friday night if you missed it. And 3000 we gave to a work in Haiti with Jim Binning, who's a friend of LeVic. Uh, they're constructing a, a, women's, a girl's dorm, and uh, they could use the extra money, so we sent 3000 to them. That's our plan. As elders, we look at the money that comes into Faith Community Church as the Lord's money, not our money. And because it's the Lord's money, we, as Denny often says, we don't want to be a reservoir where we just collect and collect and collect, but we want to be a river. And so when we have excess, we want to give a lot of that excess away. And because you, God's people, are the ones who gave the money, we wanted to let you know we're distributing that money. Now remember, our benevolence 
need doesn't go into this at all. That's a special group to help people in the community. So the Lord gets a round of applause, right, for uh, what he does here. And February and March, we had over budget giving, and so we have another $1,800 to give away. We haven't figured out where to go yet, but $1,800 more to give away. And April's not over yet. Well, let's thank the Lord. Lord, we come before you thanking you for the generosity of your people and supporting all the work of this church. And then, Lord, when you uh, bring in more, help us to be faithful and distributing to needs around the world that we see, as well as needs here at home. And so, Lord, it's, we recognize all giving is your money. If people don't want to give, that's between them and you. We will never be a church that hounds people for money. We recognize that we have a stewardship before God. And you tell us to give and to give generously. And as a church, we want to do that. So I ask that you would continue to bless Faith Community Church in years ahead, not only with programs and ministries to get the gospel out to people, but that we would help those in the mission field to let them know that we love them, we support them, and we want to be a help to them as well. So we pray this all in the great name of Jesus, that wonderful name, that powerful name that we just sang about. We pray in his name. Amen. Every month I get a, a Voice of the Martyrs magazine. And I read an article just recently about Iran. And the article is called Beyond Restrictions. Let me read a little story out of it. When the coronavirus pandemic began, Arif and his wife, Liana, were happy to follow Iran's lockdown because their, of their age put them at risk. But one day, while they were getting some fresh air in a local park, they were approached by a man who talked to them briefly about God and gave them a Bible. Arif gave it a quick look, and when he got home, he placed it on a bookshelf. Months later, Arif had a dream about a light shining brightly from the bookshelf and a voice saying, I will reveal the true way to you. You will find me there. The next morning, I thought about my dream, Arif said, and then I went to the bookshelf and I grabbed the Bible. After, 18, after eight months, I opened it with more passion and curiosity. I remembered also the guy who gave me this book. After reading some passages in the Bible, Arif returned to the first page and found a contact information for the man who had given it to him. I grabbed my phone and called the number to ask about my dream and questions that came to mind about God. Today, Araf is connected to a ministry that answers his questions and prays with him, leading him closer to Jesus Christ. Isn't that kind of a cool story? Does God work in unusual ways? He does. And we're going to look at one of the unusual ways today in Acts chapter 9. Last week, we looked at Stephen speaking out. Today, we're going to look at Jesus speaking out. Remember, Stephen's speech ended in Acts chapter 7 with his own stoning to death. And in verse 58, it tells us that the witnesses that were stoning him laid their robes at the foot of a young man named Saul. And today, we're going to look at the conversion of this very religious man named Saul. And so I titled today's message, Jesus Speaks Out. Now, Paul, who is Saul of Tarsus, Saul is his Hebrew name, Paul would you say his Christian name, he often told about his own testimony of his conversion. In Acts chapter 22, he testifies of his conversion before this temple crowd that tried to kill him. Paul asked, the, well, the soldier, if he could speak to the crowd, given permission, then he gave his testimony. In Acts chapter 24, he's before Governor Felix. He doesn't mention his conversion, but he does talk about Jesus. In Acts 26, Paul testifies of his conversion before Governor Festus and King Agrippa. And I'm going to use Acts 9, Acts 22, and Acts 26 throughout this message. But Paul, when he wrote to 
Timothy, a young pastor in 1 Timothy, he said this about his life. In verse 12, I thank Christ Jesus, Messiah Jesus, our Lord, who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful, putting me into service, even though I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a violent aggressor. Now, I underlined those. They're not in the text of Scripture underlined. But a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a violent aggressor. Yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was more than abundant with the faith and love which are found in Christ Jesus. So to Timothy, he gives a short little testimony about his life, what he was like before he came to Christ. And I believe the salvation of Saul of Tarsus was perhaps the greatest conversion story in the book of Acts. Scripture says nothing's impossible with God, right? Isn't that a good verse? Nothing is impossible with God. And God had a plan for Saul even before his birth. It says in Galatians chapter 1, verse 15, that Paul wrote that God had set him apart even from his mother's womb. Even before he was born, God had a purpose for that man, that boy named Saul. It took a while to get him converted, but God did. And our focus this morning is going to be on the three phases of one's salvation. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ and you've been saved, there are three phases to your salvation. And the first phase I'm calling is the pre-conversion, before conversion, life without Jesus as your Savior and Lord. What do we know about Saul from Scripture? Well, first we know that he's a religious Jew. It says this in Acts chapter 22, verse 3. I am a Jew, born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city, meaning Jerusalem, educated under Gamaliel, strictly according to the law of our fathers, being zealous for God, just as you all are today. He says, I am a Jew, born in Tarsus of Cilicia. Whenever you have a place, I always think it's helpful to look at a map. All right, so there's our map. You see where it says starting place? Don't start there. Go to the left, and you'll see really poorly in this LED screen. If you're on the side, you can see it really clear on the TV. You can see Tarsus. It's almost right there on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. It's in the region called Cilicia, and that's where Saul was born and spent his early days. But he said in that verse, in Acts 22, that in the bottom right corner, he's in Palestine in a place called Jerusalem. And he's being educated under a rabbi by the name of Gamaliel. Now, our story today is going to look at him in Jerusalem, but also if you go north of Palestine to Syria, at the bottom of Syria, you can see the place called Damascus. That's where we're going to be looking at today. So the three areas are Tarsus, Jerusalem, and Damascus. You got that in your mind? Okay. Saul's a religious Jew, born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but he was brought up in Jerusalem and educated under Rabbi Gamaliel. Gamaliel was a respected rabbi of the school, rabbinic school, called Hillel, H-I-L-L-E-L. There were two major schools, Shema and Hillel. Hillel was more stricter on the word of God. And so Gamaliel was under Hillel himself. And when Hillel passed on, Gamaliel took over the education of that school. He was called Rabban. Rabbi means my teacher. Rabban means our teacher. And he was called Rabban Gamaliel the Elder. Gamaliel had a student by the name of Saul. He was his pupil. And we know that Gamaliel was highly influential in the Sanhedrin. Go back with me to Acts chapter 5. Uh, 
the apostles are arrested. They're put in prison. Uh, at night in verse 19, uh, an angel of the Lord opened the gates of the prison, take them out. He said, go stand and speak to the people in the temple, the whole message of this life. And so the next day, the high priest called for this. Uh, prisoners come out and they're not there. Okay, they finally the soldiers round them up and they bring them back to the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin or the council is made up of 70 members of Sadducees and Pharisees with the high priest. So it's really 71. The high priest is over it all, or the chief priest. So the apostles are brought before the Sanhedrin. Verse 27. When they had brought them, they stood them before the council, that's the Sanhedrin. The high priest questioned them, saying, We gave you strict orders not to continue teaching in this name, meaning the name of Jesus. And yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered, I love this, We must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus. Oh, now he's preaching. He raised him up, the resurrection, whom you put to death Ooh, by hanging him on a cross. Sanhedrin is not liking this. He is the one whom God exalted to his right hand as a prince and savior to grant repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are the witnesses of these things. And so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. But when they heard this, they were cut to the quick, cut in the heart, and intended to kill them. But a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, respected by all the people, stood up in the council and gave orders to put the men outside for a short time. And he said to them, men of Israel, take care what you propose to do with these men. For some time ago, Thutis rose up claiming to be somebody, and a group of about 400 men joined up with him, but he was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed, and it came to nothing. After this, Judas of Galilee rose up in the days of the census and drew away some people after him. He too perished, and all those who followed him were scattered. So in the present case, I say to you, stay away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or action is of men, it will be overthrown. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them, or else you may be even found fighting against God. They took his advice. And after calling the apostles in, they flogged, they flogged them. Okay, so they, We're not going to just let you go. I think we need to beat you a little bit. So they flogged them and ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus, and then released them. So they, the apostles, went on their way from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for his name. Wow, what is Christianity like today? And every day in the temple and from house to house, they kept right on teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. Okay? Gamaliel, highly respected, influential over the Sanhedrin. And Saul's a religious Jew who sat at the foot of Gamaliel and his teaching. Let me tell you, being religious does not bring you salvation. Only Jesus can bring salvation to a person. Saul was a religious Jew, but Saul was also a Pharisee. In Philippians chapter 3, Paul is giving his credentials, and he said in verse 5, I was circumcised on the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, when it came to the things written by God, I was a Pharisee. A Pharisee. See, Pharisees studied Torah, the Old Testament, the five books of Moses, but they also studied the oral law, the exposition of the law that was passed down by the elders and other rabbis. Pharisees kept kosher laws. They were set apart from all things unclean. In fact, Pharisee is derivative of the Hebrew perushim, meaning separated ones. They were the separated ones. They weren't going to let Greek culture, Roman culture, taint them in any way. They were clean. They were descended from the Hasidim, pious ones. We would call them the Orthodox Jews today. 
Pharisees, they knew God's word. And in Acts 23, Paul is brought before the Sanhedrin, and he sees the Sadducees and Pharisees there, and he decides that he's not going to go on trial that day, so he stood up and said this. He said, he cried out in the council, Brethren, I am a Pharisee, a son of Pharisees. I am on trial for the hope and resurrection of the dead. Sadducees don't believe in the resurrection of the dead. Pharisees do, and they started fighting among themselves. The 70 guys started fighting among themselves. We find nothing wrong with them. If he, what happens if an angel talked to him about this? And they, Paul got out of that dilemma by saying those words. But notice he said, I am a Pharisee, a son of Pharisees. He comes from a line of Pharisees. Saul was a Pharisee. And in Acts chapter 26... We have him saying this in verses 4 and 5. So then all Jews know my manner of life from my youth up, which from the beginning was spent among my own nation and at Jerusalem, since they have known about me for a long time, if they are willing to testify that I lived as a Pharisee according to the strictest sect of our religion. Saul was a Pharisee. And he was an up-and-coming star in the Pharisee movement. How do you say that? Why do you say that? Because this is what it says in Galatians chapter 1, verse 14. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries among my countrymen, being more extremely zealous for my ancestral traditions. He was advancing in Judaism before everybody else. I bet he was Gamaliel's best pupil in class. He says, I was extremely zealous for my ancestral traditions. What were the ancestral traditions? Well, it goes back to the Torah, which is the Shema, Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5, where it says, hear, O Israel. That word hear is Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God and the Lord is one. Jews worship how many gods? One. Why did they get so angry about Jesus? He claimed to be the son of God, making himself equal to God. To the Jew, that was blasphemous. To a Pharisee, that was deserving of death. He says, all from the beginning, hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. This is the great commandments. And Saul is zealous, extremely zealous for the ancestral traditions, meaning that we worship one God, one God. And it ain't Jesus. And so you can see why he became a persecutor. Let me tell you, being devout in any religion will not save you. He was a devout Pharisee. But he was still lost. He needed Jesus. And you can be devout in any religion. Hinduism. You can be devout in Islamism. You can be devout in Judaism. Buddhism. It has nothing to do with being devout in your religion. Religion doesn't save. Jesus saves. Saul's a religious Jew. He's a Pharisee. But Saul was also a persecutor of the church in Jerusalem. Turn with me to Acts chapter 8. Stephen has just died. The coats were laid at the feet of Saul. And it says in verse 1, Saul was in hearty agreement with putting Stephen to death. And on that day, beginning with Stephen's death, on that day, a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem. And they, meaning the church in Jerusalem, the people of the church, they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles, the twelve stayed. Some devout men buried Stephen and made loud lamentation over him. But Saul, he began ravishing the church, entering house after house, and dragging off men and women, he would put them in prison. 
You got that? House to house. Did he go to the courts and say, hey, I got a warrant to come into your house? Nope. He would just go into the house and he would arrest anybody that was part of the church to put them in prison. Doesn't matter if they were men or women. Paul, in his testimony before King Agrippa, said this in Acts chapter 26, verse 9. So then, I thought to myself that I had to do many things hostile to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And this is just what I did in Jerusalem. Not only did I lock up many of the saints, meaning believers in Christ, in prisons, having received authority from the chief priests, but also when they were being put to death, I cast my vote against them. Notice that he uses the word they. He's not just referring to Stephen casting his vote against Stephen. He's voting against those he dragged out of the houses put in prison, and when they came up for trial, he cast his vote against them for death. And as I punished them often in all the synagogues, I tried to force them to blaspheme, meaning asking them, do you believe in Jesus as the Son of God? If they answered yes, That's blasphemy, and I have every right to take you and put you in prison. I got letters from the chief priest to do just that. He says, I punished them often in all the cities. I tried to force them to blaspheme, and being furiously enraged at them, I kept pursuing them even to foreign cities. Furiously enraged. I don't think we have a good picture of Saul. He's a madman. He's a man that will go into any house and pull people out on the basis of their standing for Jesus in order to have them punished and possibly put to death. Can you imagine a knock on your door in the middle of the night? Somebody coming into your house, asking you if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, and depending on whether you say yes or no, Depends on your future. See, we think of that happening not in America. We think of that happening, well, that happened in Nazi Germany, right? The Nazis coming to the doors, taking, are you Jewish? If you're Jewish, you're going to a concentration camp. We think of what happens in communist countries like, well, Russia under Stalin. Many people were put to death because they were religious. We think of what's happening now in Nigeria to Christians. By naming the name of Jesus, some of the men are put to death, shot right away. Some of the women are raped, and some of the children are taken into slavery to become sex slaves. See, we don't, we don't like hearing about that stuff in America. We don't like to hear that there's that kind of persecution going on in the world even today. But it does, and it happens to Christians. And here in The case in Jerusalem, Saul is the primary instigator. He's taking upon himself to crush this new Jesus movement. But he wasn't just a persecutor of the church in Jerusalem. He was also a persecutor of the church outside of Jerusalem. Acts chapter 8 talks about, well, the believers scattered, and it talks about what happened in Samaria when the believers got there. But picking up the story, we go to Acts chapter 9 for Saul. Verse 1. Now Saul, now Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. Not the twelve. We're talking about the believers of the Lord. He went to the high priest and he asked for letters from him, from the high priest, to the synagogues at Damascus in Syria. So that if he, Saul, found any belonging to the way, both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Saul was vocalizing murderous threats against the believer in Christ. And so he goes to the high priest and says, give me authority. 
that I can go to another city with the high priest's letter giving me the authority to capture people who belong to the way. Now, the way was a terminology term for a follower of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And so the believers, they weren't called Christians yet until much later, Acts 13, I believe, or 11. Anyway, look that up later. (laughs) They weren't called Christians. They were referring to themselves as we belong to the way. The way. We belong to what Jesus is, the way, the truth, and the life. And so Saul says to the high priest, give me letters that I can go and bind men and women who belong to the way and bring them back for punishment. Wow. I don't know what you think of Saul, but if you were a young believer in Jerusalem or even in Damascus, you would not be looking forward to this religious Pharisee coming to your synagogue. That was his life before Christ. That was the pre-conversion stage of Saul's life. But the second phase is one's own personal conversion story, meeting Jesus, meeting Jesus for salvation. And Saul met Jesus in a miraculous way. It was a miracle. Look at verse 3. As he was traveling, that he was approaching Damascus. It happened that he was approaching Damascus. He's not in the city yet. And suddenly, meaning out of nowhere, a light from heaven flashed around him, and he fell to the ground. And he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Notice that Jesus took the initiative. As Saul's approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. In Acts 26, verse 13, Paul said it this way. At midday, in the middle of the day, he's talking to the king. At midday, I saw on the way a light from heaven brighter than the sun, shining all around me and those who were journeying with me. Notice he wasn't alone on his journey to Damascus. He had others going with him. And all of a sudden, here's this light that flashes brighter than the sun, causing Saul to fall to the ground. And he heard the voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Persecuting Christians would be the same as persecuting Christ Jesus. In Acts 26, 14, he goes on to say, and when we had all fallen to the ground, it wasn't just Saul who fell to the ground because of this light. We had all fallen to the ground, and I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew dialect, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goats. Now, in Acts 26, he adds that phrase that's not recorded in Acts chapter 9, where the Lord Jesus says, it is hard for you to kick against the goads. What's a goad? Well, it's usually a sharp stick pointed at the end. And when you have cattle or you have pigs, uh, well, Jews wouldn't have pigs, but if you had any kind of an animal and you're trying to get them to go in a certain direction and they refuse to go, you goad them. You don't insult them, goading them that way. You stick him with that sharp stick. And if you stick an animal with a sharp stick, they will move. And Jesus is saying to Saul, aren't you getting tired of kicking against the goads? In other words, every time you get goaded, you're kicking against it instead. In other words, God has been trying over time to get Saul's attention, not only through the word of God that he's been studying, but if he was present in the Sanhedrin in Acts chapter 4, 
Then he heard Peter talking about there is salvation and no one else. There is only one name under heaven by which we are saved, the name of Jesus. In Acts chapter 5, he would have heard Gamaliel, and he would have heard Peter talking about Jesus rise, rose from the dead. You are the ones who put him on the cross and killed him. But he is at the right hand of God now. Saul would have heard all that if he was there. In Acts chapter 6 and 7, when Stephen's brought before the Sanhedrin, being a student of Gamaliel, he probably was there because he was instrumental in the part of his killing him with the coats and stuff. So he heard all of Stephen's speech about Jesus. And remember, Stephen ended his speech by saying to the Sanhedrin, why are you always resisting the Holy Spirit? You stiff-necked people. Jesus is saying, aren't you finding it hard to kick against the goads? I've been trying to move you in a certain direction, and you've been resistant. Holy Spirit's prodding him. And Saul responds with a question. Who are you, Lord? I think deep down he knew. Jesus answered, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Verse 5. When he tells a story to the, the crowd outside the temple and Acts 22, verse 8, he said, I am Jesus, the Nazarene, whom you are persecuting. And in verse 6 of Acts 9, Jesus said, get up and enter the city, and it will be told you what you must do. Get up. And in verse 8, Saul got up from the ground. And though his eyes were open, he could see nothing, and leading him by the hand, they, the people with him, brought him into Damascus. Jesus commanded, get up, and he obeyed. Now, to be honest, this is not a normal salvation story. Do you agree with me? The Lord doesn't always get us our attention in this type of a manner. In fact, when I present the gospel of Jesus Christ, I normally invite people to receive Jesus using what I call the simple ABC. A is come to the point in your life where you admit you're a sinner. All have sinned. All fall short of the glory of God. You're a sinner. God knows it. The wages of sin is death. Admit you're a sinner. B is believe. Believe that Jesus loved you so much he went to the cross to pay for your sin. And when he died on the cross, he paid for your sin. And when you put your faith and trust in him, you get salvation. But C means then confess him as your Savior and Lord. If we confess with our mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, Scripture says you will be saved. So I like to give the invitation like an A, B, C. Is that what Jesus did? No. Light shines from heaven. Saul, would you admit you're a sinner? No, that's not there. Does Saul know he's a sinner? Yeah, he's the one that rode for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. He knows he's a sinner. But how is he saved then? Because salvation comes through repentance and faith. Repentance is changing your mind. Saul needed to change his mind about who Jesus is is. Jesus is the Christ. He is the Messiah. He is the Son of God. And in that instance, when he hears the voice of Jesus and he sees Jesus, because Ananias says, God's let you see a vision of the righteous one. Anyway, he sees Jesus, he hears him, and he has repentance immediately. He changes his mind immediately. And how do I know that he believed? Because he obeyed. He trusted and obeyed. Saul met Jesus in a miraculous way, but the other men witnessed the spectacle, but they did not meet Jesus. It says in verse 7, they stood, the men who traveled with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. In Acts 22, verse 9, in the retelling of the story, Paul wrote, And those who were with me saw the light, to be sure, but did not understand the voice or the sound of the one who was speaking to me. 
they had the same vision. They saw the light. They heard the voice. They heard the sound. But they did not have the understanding because God was using Jesus at that moment in time to save who? Saul. That's why it's in church, it happens all the time that people hear the same gospel message, but people sometimes hear it over and over again, and it means nothing to them. It's like God never shined the light on them for really understanding. Well, these who were with Saul led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. The conversion, encountering Jesus. But the third phase of a salvation story is post-conversion. What happens after salvation? Life with Jesus after salvation. He's my Savior. He's my Lord. Does this mean that once I come to know Jesus Christ as Savior, I never sin again? I never make a mistake again? Uh Uh-uh. Our Christian life is up and down. Anybody find their Christian life up and down? Hopefully, it's going upward as we go back up and down. We're always going towards Jesus looking more like him, but we all struggle. Even Paul struggled. We may get to that one day. But Saul's life was changed immediately. See, in Acts 22, verse 10, Paul gives a little detail that Luke didn't mention in Acts chapter 9. Because after Jesus said, I am Jesus the Nazarene, whom you are persecuting, Paul wrote in Acts 22.10, I said, what shall I do, Lord? What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, get up and go on into Damascus, and there you will be told of all that has been appointed for you to do. Paul called Jesus what? Lord. That just doesn't mean master. In this context, when he's looking at a vision in heaven, he's calling Jesus God. What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord Jesus gives him instruction. And although he's blind, and probably if it was us, we'd want to go home. Right? I can't see. I want to go home. And home's in Jerusalem for him. He obeys and goes to Damascus. It says in verse 9 that he was three days in Damascus without sight and neither or neither ate nor drank. Was he fasting? I'm not sure. But at the end of verse 11, which we'll cover more next week, it says at the end of 11, he is praying. His life changed. He's no longer the man he once was. Saul became a changed man. And we'll look more at that next week. But every Christ follower has a conversion story. Every one of us. If you're a member of the family of God and you put your trust in Jesus Christ, you have a conversion story. Life without Jesus. What was your life like without Jesus? Life encountering Jesus for salvation. And life with Jesus and becoming transformed, changed to look like Jesus. So I ask you, can you tell your conversion story? Some people have a conversion story that's supernatural, like Saul of Tarsus. I think I have that. I found this reading in an Acts commentary by F.F. Bruce. It's about a man named Sundar Singh from India. He was born in 1889, a long time ago. But he became an Indian Christian missionary whose life and message had far-reaching impact. But he was born into a Sikh family, and he grew up as a faithful Sikh. Sundar Singh's mother took him weekly to sit at the feet of Sadhu, an aesthetic holy man, who lived in the jungle some miles away. She also sent him to the Christian mission school where he could learn English. English was important. But at the death of Sundar Singh's mother, when he was only 14, it plunged him into violence and despair. 
He turned on the missionaries, persecuted their Christian converts, ridiculed their faith. In final defiance of their religion, he bought a Bible and burned it page by page in his home compound while his friends looked on. His friends looked on. Three nights later, he went to his room, determining to commit suicide the next day on the railway line. F.F. F. Bruce, in his commentary on Acts, wrote this. He was praying in his room in the early morning, and he saw a great light. And Sundar says, I prayed and looked into the light. I saw the form of the Lord Jesus Christ. It had such an appearance of glory and love. If it had been some Hindu incarnation, I would have prostrated myself before it. But it was the Lord Jesus Christ, the one I'd been insulting a few days before. I felt that a vision like this could not come out of my own imagination. I heard a voice saying in Hindustani, How long will you persecute me? I have come to save you. You are praying to know the right way. Why do you not take it? The thought came to me, Jesus Christ is not dead, but living, and it must be he himself. So I fell at his feet and got this wonderful peace, which I could not get anywhere else. When I got up, the vision had all disappeared, but the peace and joy have remained with me ever since. Before dawn, he wakened his father to announce that he had seen Jesus Christ in a vision and heard his voice. Henceforth, he would follow Christ forever. Still only 15, he utterly committed himself to Christ for the next 25 years. He witnessed extensively for Jesus Christ. But back then, his father pleaded and demanded that he give up his conviction. When he refused, his father, Sher Singh, Singe, gave him a farewell feast for his son, then denounced him and expelled him from the family. But on his 16th birthday, he participated in a public Christian baptism and followed Jesus Christ ever since. He had a vision experience like Saul of Tarsus. How many of you had one like that? The next picture is a picture of a man named Tom Doyle. Tom Doyle is vice president and Middle East director for E3 Partners since 2001. Tom's experience in the heart of Islamic nations is extensive. Tom graduated from Biola College in 1979 and Dallas Theological Seminary in 1983. He has written seven books, including the best-selling Dreams and Visions is Jesus Awakening the Muslim World. In that book, he recounts story after story of Muslims without any kind of a Christian witness getting a vision or dream of Jesus. See, we, we kind of discount that here in America, right? God never works in that way. But sometimes he does. Some people have a, a salvation experience in a supernatural way, like Saul of Tarsus. Some people have been saved out of a deep, sinful lifestyle. They have lived life on their own terms, indulging in every sinful behavior they can think of, and then they find Jesus, and their life dramatically changes. We hear those testimonies, and we stand in awe of God's grace and mercy. Pastor Tony's got one of those kind of testimonies. Go hear it. Ask him one day to give it. Some of us have been saved out of a deep, sinful lifestyle. But some of us have been saved out of a religious upbringing. That's me. Think of Nicodemus. Did Nicodemus come to know Jesus Christ as a Savior? Absolutely, he was a disciple of the Lord. He was also a Pharisee. He was brought up as a Jew. He lived his life as a Pharisee. And when he confronted Jesus and asked him about life, Jesus says, unless you are born again, you will not see the kingdom of God. You could be religious and still not know God and be saved through the blood of Jesus Christ. I was brought up in a religious environment. My parents were Baptists. I went to church at the age of one. Actually, at the age of zero, maybe one week. One week, they kept me out of church, and then they started putting me in the nursery. But I didn't come to know Jesus until I was about six. 
How much sin could I have gotten into at the age of six? Well, I had three sisters, so you can wonder. But when I heard the gospel, I knew I needed a Savior. And my father led me to Jesus Christ. And my life changed. I didn't become perfect, but my life changed. And over time, hopefully I'm looking more like Jesus more this year than I did last year. I have my ups and downs. I still have three sisters, so I'm not always sinless. But God changes lives. And if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you have a conversion story. What was your life like before you met Jesus? How did you meet Jesus? How did he save you? And then how have you started to change after salvation? Now, if there's no change, you've got to go back and question, did you really meet Jesus yet? Because when you meet Jesus and you come to faith in Jesus Christ, God gives you the Holy Spirit. And he who began a good work in you will perfected until the day of the coming of Jesus Christ. You will be changing to look like Jesus. Do you have a conversion story? Father, we come before you thanking you for what we hear and have seen and witnessed from the word of God regarding Saul of Tarsus. We all need Jesus. We need him for salvation. But we also need him after salvation because we follow him. We live for him. We serve him because we love him. Lord, we come before you this morning, and you know every person in this room. You know every person who is watching this online. You know whether or not they have a conversion story. And if they don't, may they come up and talk with me or one of the elders right after this service. If they're watching online, may they contact the church. Jesus Christ saves lives. And we ask him to do it even today in this church. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.